Welcome to the Awakening Podcast. And today I would love to introduce you my very special guest, Dr. Paul Hubbard. He's a founder of the Institute for Holographic Sound and Inner Balance. He also holds PhD in psychology. He's certified in grief and addictions recovery. He's a Reiki master and he teaches sound healing around the globe. And today we'll be talking about sound vibration and sound healing. And I'm so excited to welcome his in our episode. Hi, Paul. Hi, Olga. Thank you so much. It's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you. And to start, I would love to ask you our traditional question. If you ever had a moment of the awakening when your life was separated for before and after, if you have this moment, please share with us. Well, I've, I've had a few of those moments. <clears throat> One very early on, when I was in my mid-20s, um, I had a, uh, a really powerful, it was a very critical time in my life, and a lot of crazy stuff going on, and I had a really clear connection with God. And uh, it was essentially an intervention, an intervention in my life to help me make a shift, to move onto a new path. Um, and it's it's kind of a long story, so I'm not sure that I really want to get you know get into that. But I I had another, um, and this was to do with my sound work. And back in 1991, I received a message from Spirit. And the message was, if you don't start using your voice, you're going to regret it for the rest of your life. And now I've, I've always loved music. Um, but to use my voice and vocalize, a oh, whole different story. And it was a very clear message. And... Um, I'm one, I certainly don't want to have regrets. And so I kind of reluctantly began to move into looking for ways to um, to become more comfortable with using my voice. And at first, I thought it was simply about singing. And in short time, I realized that wasn't the case. It was about using sound and using the voice for healing. And once that awakening came, then it was, you know, all ahead full, you know, because then the path became clear to me. So I, I've had many of those kinds of experiences where literally life changing. And right along that same period, my eyes change colors. My eyes used to be like just totally brown, and now they're like a, a greenish golden kind of color. <laughs> really strange. Yeah, that's amazing. But it's actually um, interesting because our body changes all the time and our cells always renew. So who are you are right now, it's not the same person who you were 10 years ago. It was completely different cells. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I would love you to share with us your story a little bit in more details. How did you learn about sound healing and singing balls? How did it all came in, into your life? Well, <clears throat> my background is, as you mentioned, my background is in psychology and counseling. And I've done that work for many years. Um, primarily focused in working with families and working with addictions. And um, <clears throat> as I just mentioned, the story about using the voice, well, that came about. And 
as I began to progress in working with the voice and working with sound, around 1995, I got a message from, I, I'm sorry, I didn't get a message. I was at a workshop and the facilitator was uh, leading us in a meditation. And she brought out this thing and started to play it. And it was a crystal bowl. And I'm, you know, I just, you know, I was mesmerized. It's like, what is that and where do I get one? And so that was my first introduction to the crystal balls. I, I have a bunch behind me here um, that I'm actually set up for my Monday night meditations back behind us. My, this is my, my uh, living room slash studio mm -hmm. at, the, at this moment. And, but anyway, the, my interest and work with the crystal bowls just uh, got, that's, that's where that began. And I began to blend the voice and the bowls because they, they're so complementary to one another. And um, I began to also integrate the sound into my other workshops, into the other work that I was doing at that time, which entailed working with the belief system and working with grief recovery. And uh, what I found was when I blended sound in with these other works, that everything took on a whole new um, experience. You know, people in the workshop and the training, they were able to go much deeper than previously. And through the sound, we were able to transform, assist in transforming old beliefs. And then <clears throat> on the other end, the sound helped to anchor those new beliefs into the system. And the thing about the belief system is that everything we think, everything we feel, everything we say and do is based on our belief system. Mm -hmm. And when you ask yourself sometimes, why did I do that? You know, why do I keep doing this, whatever this might be? That's why. It's because it's whatever the situation is, it's triggering the belief system, and your belief system is just playing forward whatever the response is for that event. Um, and sometimes that's good. And sometimes that's not good. You know, much of our belief system are, are beliefs that keep us healthy, keep us strong, uh, protect us, and so on. And then there are many that, particularly when we get into adulthood, that really sabotage us. That maybe at one time in our lives, they, they were advantageous and they helped to protect us. But then as we got older, they begin to work against us. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the thing about the belief system. And that's, that particular work that I do uh, is about going in and helping one, helping a person to shift those beliefs that no longer serve us. That in some cases may never have served us. And and at least at this point, may no longer serve us. And so as, I'm, as, as I work with someone in that way, and then also blend in the sound work, there's, there's just, there are no limits mm -hmm. to what we can do, you know, to what we can transform. And when it comes to illnesses that we may have, the belief system also ties into that. And the way it ties in is we, we have areas within our bodies physically that are sometimes weaker than other areas. And that's where the disease focuses on or illnesses focus on. They go into those areas that are, and it's, it's really kind of logical, you know, it's, they go into the areas that are easiest to get into. And those weaknesses tie into our emotions 
which tie into our belief system. Mm -hmm. And so if we can shift beliefs that create those, those emotions or hurtful emotions that, um, that can cause those weaknesses in the system, then we can help to circumvent illness. And we can also not only circumvent illness, but help to heal illnesses or things that are going on with the body already. Mm -hmm. So that's the type of work that I do and that I, I bring out and along with the holographic sound healing work. In, uh, in 1999, I began to, I, I started taking groups to Egypt. And I took my first group in 1999 and, um, and have pretty much every year since I've, I've taken groups over. But in 99, when I returned back, I, I was invited to go up to Canada to do a workshop. And so Canada is happens to be a place that was a very um, uh, consciousness altering experience for me because it I, I've done many many workshops in Canada over over the years and <clears throat> this first one the woman who invited me to come up and do a workshop asked me to. I was doing a belief system workshop and she said, can you add an extra day to the training and do something with the Hathors? And the Hathors are fifth dimensional and upward beings and they're recognized and known as masters of sound and love. They had a very strong prominence in Egypt, hence my connection to Egypt. And so I, and they're, they in themselves are a story, you know, mm -hmm. um, very loving beings, very much they're, they, they're very angelic in their nature and they work with the angels. And <clears throat> so I checked in with my guides. And this was back in 99. I said, what am I supposed to do? And all I had to do was ask. And they just began to download all this information for me. And the downloading continued, and still is continuing, but there was a big a bulk of it that came across over the next couple of years. But in that very beginning, when I began to get that information, it was, and it was very fast that, that the information was coming. It was coming in, in dreams and meditation. Uh, it was coming, I could be sitting at the computer working and then all of a sudden they'd come through with some new piece of information. And this all was the beginning and the basis for holographic sound healing, mm -hmm. which is the name that they gave me to apply to the work is holographic sound healing because and the thing about holographic sound is that it's working with sound multi-dimensionally so it's literally through sacred geometry we open the sound up into its multi-dimensional form and when we do that we're able to hit every level of consciousness as we're working with another person with a client with a group, uh, you name it. And hence the power of holographic sound. And for so many years, we've used sound linearly, more, more so on a linear basis with very rare exceptions, with some exceptions, but very rare. And in 99, it, we actually reached a level in our consciousness as humanity where our vibration had been or has been rising. And it hit a pivotal point where we were once again able to bring through and hold the energy and hold the vibration for holographic sound because we lost it back in the early, early days of Egypt. We lost that vibration because our vibration had been dropping over many, many years from Atlantean times on into our, our current history 
ish type times. And our vibration had been moving from a matriarchal more into a patriarchal energy. And it's that's not about gender. It's simply about the, the pendulum of energy swinging from one side to the next. And then we went through the dark ages that we're familiar with and very dark times. And that was pretty much, I would say, probably our low point is during the Dark Ages. And then things began to slowly rise again. And again, rising to the point of back in 99, it was a pivotal time. And we finally reached a point to where we were able, again, to hold the vibration, to hold the energy for the multidimensional sound and to open it up into its holographic nature. Mm -hmm. So that information, it's, it was time and it began to flow. And there are other things that occurred when that happened. For instance, our vibration rising, our chakras actually began to shift in color. And the color is simply um, resonant with the vibration. The vibration is actually what shifted. The color is just emanated from the vibration. And so our chakras began to move into higher vibrational colors, into higher vibrational energies, which we're now working with. So that that's what, what has brought me to be where I am today uh, and for a, particularly for the work that I do. Um, things continue to grow. The, the vibration clearly, now when you look around in, in the country, uh, in the U.S., well actually around the world, it uh, it's, can look pretty crazy out there. And um, you know, you might ask yourself, well, how can, how can the energy or the vibration possibly be rising with all of that stuff that's going on. And the thing is, is all of that stuff that's going on, it's because the vibration is rising, you know, and things are bubbling to the surface. And just like with our emotions, as our vibration personally rises, things bubble to the surface. Our emotions bubble to the surface. And the reason that happens is the universe is giving us an opportunity to clear it to transform it and move into a higher energetic place. And same thing with everything that's going on around the earth now and around and with humanity. I mean, we're literally rising into a higher vibration and stuff is happening. You know, things are coming up. So it, it's, it doesn't always look good and it doesn't always feel good. But ultimately, it's a good thing. Mm -hmm. And what so, is the vibration? What is vibration of our body and how it interacts with vibration of uh, outside world? Well, as above, so below. We simply, we're, we're one. We're one with one another. We're one with the universe, we're one with the earth, um, may not always seem, in fact, often it doesn't seem like that, but we are. And as our vibration shifts, the earth mirrors our vibration. And as the earth's vibration shifts, we mirror the earth's vibration. And so we, you know, we directly affect one another, humanity and earth. So, yeah, that's big perfect. connection. Mm -hmm. And uh, how can sound healing help to raise our vibration? And what is that specifically? What does it do to our body? Because I've heard that our body, each of our organ create a noise and vibration. And uh, we, we, have different vibration and when we hear this magical singing balls it kind of like restart our entire body and uh, if we have any disharmony or what's called disease 
it puts everything in balance and more harmonic so it helps healing that is that a right perception or is there anything high, um, <laughs> bigger than that well you you know you you pretty much said it um <clears throat> our bodies everything within our bodies has a sound vibration a resonance to it we're we're like a symphony of sounds and when and many, many, well, again, a symphony, many, many vibrations within the physical body. And those are beyond our physical hearing capability. But nonetheless, there is a sound vibration, not only vibration, but a sound that emanates from all parts of the body. You know, like with, uh, with animals, with a dog, for instance, they're able to hear sounds, hear frequencies higher than we're able to hear. And so those, those vibrations are going on. We just don't always hear them. And how that relates to uh, ourselves physically or our, um, our health is that when we're, when we're not feeling well in simple terms, our vibra our body is vibrating out of tune it's out of harmony mm -hmm. and so with focused intent and with the sound vibration the focused sound vibration we can literally go in and shift the energy and help the body rebalance itself help the body tune itself back up into a uh, harmonious place. So that's what the sound healing work does, particularly that's what the holographic sound work does, is it really taps into, in, in, into the body and into the system to bring things back into a harmonic balance. Mm, beautiful. And do you have any idea of how old is uh, this knowledge and uh, how old people are practicing sound healing? What's the origination of all this wisdom? Well, <clears throat> it may not have always been called sound healing, but sound has been used throughout time. There really is no time that sound has not been used uh, in, in the writings of creation from the Bible. It, it talks about first was the word. I'm paraphrasing here. Mm -hmm. But first was the word, and the word is sound vibration. And from the word, all things were created. And all things continue to be created and such. Also, uh, if you look back, and if you're familiar with the Vedas, which is an ancient text that was found in India, predates both Bibles, the Old and New Testaments. And there's a phrase in the Vedas, or many phrases, but this particular phrase is Nada Brahman. And what that means is the world is sound. The world is sound. I mean, there is not a time in history that sound vibration has not been used. It is the foundation of creation, mm -hmm. is sound vibration. If you look at our indigenous cultures around the world, they all use sound for various um, movements, rites of passage from, uh, from birth to, uh, to healing, in whether it be in with children, adults, whatever, using sound also for rites of passage, moving from childhood into adulthood. There's ritual, there's sound vibration that's used to help perpetuate that transformation. And then also on the other end with death. Mm -hmm. And the sound vibration is used or the sound is used in those in those different um, experiences and times and events, and I say sound vibration because the sound and sim simply creates the vibration. 
and the vibration creates the sound. Mm -hmm. You know, if you take a guitar string or a guitar and you pluck the string, what's happening? The string is vibrating. And what does that vibration do? It creates a sound. Absolutely. The crystal bowls. You know, you, you take and you create friction. I mean, I have a crystal bowl behind me. Let me, yes, let me grab sure. one. <laughs> so here's a crystal bowl. And if you take and create friction. And the friction causes it to vibrate. And then the vibration creates a tone. Can you hear that? Yes, yeah, so beautiful. And it's so perfect. <laughs> So beautiful. Yeah, they're amazing instruments, yes. amazing tools for helping in transformation. Mm -hmm. So sound has been around way beyond our written history. Mm -hmm. Sound has been used back in times of Atlantis, uh, back into Lemuria. Every, every era where we have any kind of knowledgeable connection, sound has been a part of it. Mm -hmm. it. It's like you can't have creation without sound. Yes. Yogis also believe yeah. that um, our universe started from Big Bang and it created universal sound OM and that was the origination of all creation. Well, <clears throat> that's one story. That's one piece of our history. It's, and I, I believe that it, that it actually goes beyond the Big Bang. The Big Bang, I, I, I believe, plays a part in how our Earth evolved, and then hence we came about. But at the same time, I, I believe that it, it, it was going on before then as well. Mm. That that's, that's just, you know, that's just the, the starting point that we're able to, to have some connection with. Yes, absolutely. And uh, how does it relate it to our DNA? I know you on our course, you were talking about uh, DNA research by Dr. Sasumu Ochna. And uh, um, do you know any other researches about this correlation, like a scientific articles or studies? About uh, how, how our uh, DNA connects with sound? Yes, and sound healing. Um, I, I, I don't know of other, um, other studies that are, that have been done. I know they're out there. I just, I don't know what they are. Um, but the sound vibration or the sound can definitely stimulate the DNA and stimulate the DNA into, um, into a higher vibration or into a, um, what's the word? Enlivening more strands of our DNA. Mm -hmm. And the sound vibration used, again, with intention and the specific sounds, the specific frequencies that one creates can enliven the DNA and enliven more strands than what you're normally, what we normally are accustomed to. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's beautiful. And what, uh, how does different uh, singing balls are related to our different chakras? Is there any correlation in between them? And the sound vibration? Yes. 
Well, <clears throat> loosely, the chakras in, in a manner follow what we call the C scale. So root chakra connects with the note, the tone C. The second chakra with D, third chakra E, F for the heart chakra, which is the fourth chakra, fifth chakra throat, G, then A in the third eye and B in the crown. And again, I say that loosely because <clears throat> There are those that walk among us that that does not connect particularly with them. You know, that there are different tones that resonate with, with parts of their body. Mm -hmm. So I would say most of us will, will have a connection to those, to the tones in that way as the C scale as it moves up the chakras, up to seven chakras. Uh, but it's it's not totally consistent. Mm -hmm. There yeah. are some that that have a completely different resonant. Yeah, because uh, there is uh, different systems of uh, notes in different cultures, and in India there is a certain type of uh, note structure when there is over 13 different notes and there is like tones and undertones and uh, um, it's it's hard to find this connection if you consider different structures of music well <clears throat> let's say even even when i say um, the c resonates with the root chakra that doesn't always mean that what's going to bring the root chakra into balance is a C. It could be any any number of other frequencies. Uh, it could be like you were mentioning overtones and under. You know, it it <clears throat> there's no solid rule of thumb if that makes sense. We, we have the structure that we've set up with the C scale, and that's something we can work with and work from. And that's, to me, that's the beauty of holographic sound, is that we work with sound intuitively, not, I want to be careful here. Uh, we work with sound intuitively, not necessarily scientifically. That's right. While I, I um, totally respect what science has been able to come up with and verify as far as the power of sound, and I think it's I think it's wonderful, and I'm grateful for it because it helps to bring greater credence and and understanding to what we do. But something I've also found is that oftentimes science tries to nail down one particular frequency to heal something with anybody, uh, with, with everyone. Say, um, say the heart. Uh, you know, to heal something particular with the heart, and science could potentially come up with one frequency, and that one frequency will heal the heart for everyone. It doesn't work that way. And even, not only does it not work that way, but it may work in one instance, but the next not. And every individual, I can do a session with someone and doing a, you know, with a particular focus to, to bring about healing to whatever, you know, let's say the stomach. And <clears throat> so one day I'll do a session with them and certain frequencies, certain tones will come through. A few days later, they'll come up 
come in for a, or a week later they'll come in for a second session the frequencies and sound vibration needed at that second time is likely completely different than the first mm -hmm. why because the person has changed mm -hmm. the person's vibration has shifted from the first experience to the second things aren't the same anymore. So therefore, now the frequencies that are needed or helpful to bring in a higher, even higher state of balance are different than they were the first time. So we're shifting and changing all the time. So because of that, the work that I do is to work with people to, to at as best they possibly can be in touch with their intuitive essence, their intuitive energy, and connect that intuitive energy with the person they're working with. Yeah. And then bring that vibration through accordingly. Yeah. That makes sense? Yes. Let the gut work through your body and through your voice and through your instruments. It's also one of the amazing knowledge I've got from yoga school it's to consider your body as God's instrument and let it just transfer this energy and love and whatever you create like a Krishna flute <laughs> in Hindu yeah. yes yeah because we we are emanations of God of, or spirit uh, of we we are connected and of the essence of universal consciousness and our bodies themselves are holographic in nature you know if you you take one cell from a person's body and it holds all the information for the entire body so essentially you can recreate the whole body from one cell that's holographic mm -hmm. again as above so below and the thing is is literally the universe is created in in the same way yeah. we humans walking around we're like cells of the universe and as we all come together we hold the information for the entire creation and as we all come together, we create a body that we call the universe. It's yes. all holographic. Yes. Tell us more about uh, holographics and sacred geometry and what is flower of life? How do you use it also in your meditations and uh, sound healing? Well, the flower of life is a geometric design it's it's uh, two-dimensionally it's a circle um, well it appears like a circle it's actually many many circles that are intersecting one another and those intersecting points of two circles that's called the vesica pisces and the vesica pisces that's the energy of creation and as these circles intersect, each one creating a vesica Pisces, and as you go around continuing to intersect these circles, you create what's known as the flower of life. Geometrically speaking, the flower of life is said to hold all information for creation from a geometric standpoint. All information. And people will look at the two-dimensional view of the flower of life and well okay but the thing is really it's when you take it and expand it out three-dimensionally that's what holds information for all creation is that three-dimensional version of the flower of life you'll find that all solid platonic Form, solid, uh, you know, platonic solids will fit within the flower of life. For instance, what I'm talking about, the cube 
fits perfectly in the flower of life sphere. Mm -hmm. Uh, the star tetrahedron, which a lot of people sometimes, you know, they'll refer to the star tetrahedron as a Merkaba. Well, the star tetrahedron is not a Merkaba. The star tetrahedron is a geometric form. It happens to be one of the forms that is used, that some use as a Merkaba or light body field. But in itself, it's simply a geometric design. It happens to be a very significant one, um, as well as the octahedron. The octahedron is found also within that that flower of life sphere, and the the uh, dodecahedron, the icosahedron. Everything is found within that sphere and connects perfectly within the sphere mm -hmm. and so in our work and i don't want to go too deep into this but in our work we utilize that spherical energy that what i'll what i refer to as sacred geometric design and we'll use that that holographic sphere or that uh, that three-dimensional sphere, the flower of life. And through that, we're able to, there's, there's a, um, a connection, a blending of that energy with sound. And when that happens, when that occurs, the energy is just, it's exponential. I mean, it just keeps, uh, expanding, expanding, expanding when the when the blend occurs mm -hmm. between sound and between the flower of life sphere. And for those who would love to learn more about sacred geometry, uh, which books would you recommend to start reading from? Okay. Was that one of the questions on my list? <laughs> Yes, I have a list, uh, uh, um, list of the books you recommended at the end of our course. And uh, the only one I've heard about was the Melchizedek Method, authored and presented by Alton Kamadon. Uh, uh -huh. And The Flower of Life by Drunavo Mal Melchizedek. Drunvalo Melchizedek, yes. The Flower of Life books um, by Drunvalo. Mm -hmm. Good, mostly good reference information in there. There's a lot of good stuff in there. Um, and the Melchizedek Method from Alton Camadon. Now, Alton, he uh, crossed over back in the mid-2000s. Actually, Alton Camadon is, uh, I invited him to co-host my first trip to Egypt. Mm -hmm. So he and I co-hosted that together. Um, amazing information he brought through and um, uh, he's Australian he, he's from Australia uh, but made many trips over to the US and to India and other parts in Europe and um, anyway he he's uh, got good reference information and Drunvalo as well has some really good reference information. Mm -hmm. uh, Tom Kenyon has some extraordinary information about sound, the power of sound. Um, Tom has done a tremendous amount of work in the sound healing arena. And whatever, uh, you know, whatever books that he's written, uh, one being the Hathor material, uh, has great information in it. And also, uh, uh, Greg Braden. Greg Braden has done extraordinary work in blending sound, or blending, I'm sorry, not, uh, well, somewhat in, with sound, but blending science and spirituality mm -hmm. together. Greg is a master at that. Um, so those people in the books that they have come through with are highly recommended. 
uh, you'll those will keep you busy for a while. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Amazing. You're welcome. And uh, uh, how would you suggest to choose singing bowls? Because um, once I completed my course, I've got those beautiful bowls and um, lots of my friends started to ask me, how do you choose them? Where did you get them from? Um, what are materials that can be used? Because um, there is not only crystal balls, but only uh, metal, but also metal balls, which made of nine different uh, metals. And there is a golden one, silver. Like, what's the difference between all of them? Well, <clears throat> the metal balls are generally made from from sometimes nine different metals. Um, most you'll you'll find more frequently seven and five metals. Um, if you're able to, to get a hold of an antique uh, metal bowl, then you're more likely to find one that's made with the nine metals. Uh, the ones that have been made that, that we wouldn't call antiques, they're great bowls, uh, but they're generally seven or five metals. And then there are some that are, that are um, brass or just a, a single a single metal and they're they're okay you know they're if I was going to do sound healing work I would not go that direction because it's just a it, it's a it's a good knockoff mm -hmm. you know and it's definitely if that's all you can get hey it beats not having anything for sure now with the crystal bowls <clears throat> there are several different types of bowls now. Originally, the crystal bowls, they were essentially pure quartz crystal. And whether you know it or not, the crystal bowls originated in the computer industry. Mm -hmm. In our day and time, they came from the computer industry and they're, they're still used in the computer industry because all of the, the wafers that we create the silicon components from those wafers are made and and the heating takes place inside a crystal bowl and so originally they were used in that process and then it was found that rather than just uh, throwing them away or destroying them that they made a tone wow. and so around the mid 80s they began to be incorporated in with sound healing work um, now they have been in existence for a long long time and just in our day and time they've surfaced through the computer industry i've seen crystal bowls in egypt that are that are ancient that are you know beyond antique um, <clears throat> Now, along with the crystal bowls, things that, that have begun to happen is blending other stones with the bowls. And what I call these are alchemical fusion bowls. And for instance, some, uh, I've, I've got a couple behind me. I'm not sure if, if they'll, if I can, I'll try and show them to you, but whether they'll show up very well or not is another story. But, um, um, the alchemical fusion bowls are quartz crystal and other stones, other elements blended with them. For instance, obsidian, creating using black obsidian and blending with the quartz crystal. And the obsidian carries its own unique energies, that particular stone. Uh, it's very complementary to the root chakra. It's also an energy of, of, um, of protection. It's, a, it's just a very powerful stone. Other stones that we blend with the crystal, besides obsidian, are uh, rose quartz or morganite, which are both very complementary to the heart. Um, emerald, blending emerald with quartz crystal, complementary to the second chakra now with its higher vibrational color. Um, also secondarily to the heart. 
and um, sapphire, very complementary to the throat chakra, and that blending with uh, the quartz crystal. And <clears throat> let's see, other stones that we blend, sometimes doing some blending with amethyst, um, with citrine, and I've, I've begun doing some blending with some different and actually bringing in several different stones, two to three different stones in addition to the quartz, creating, um, for instance, uh, bringing in morganite and emerald and black obsidian at the same time. And I have, I have one back here. Let's see if you can, you can mm -hmm. see the different colors in the bowl and so there the the different stones and the different qualities of those stones all come together and while this is a d note a d tone the the energy of the note and the energy of the bowl also carries the energy of the stones with it when you're creating sound mm -hmm. so they're really cool mm -hmm. that's amazing yes and then um, this is a black obsidian bowl, and it's they're awesome, awesome. <laughs> they look so beautiful. <laughs> wow. And we can find uh, most of them on your website, right? You can. Here's a platinum bowl this is platinum blended with coarse crystal mm -hmm. and then the gold one which is 24 karat gold that's the one that i played earlier and that's gold in the quartz crystal blended so there are there are several different types and blendings of of stones with bowls and each one carries its its own unique quality about them there's really no no two bowls that are alike. You know, they're they're all different. While they might be the same note, they're different in how they present that note. Mm -hmm. And the different types also uh, will present a, a different. Um, like the the gold and platinum bowls, they have a very unique sound to them. And uh, as well as the alchemical fusion, they have a, a unique sound to them too, but it's different than the gold and the platinum. And it's different than just a, uh, a pure quartz bowl, pure, you know, the, the, well, the pure, the original quartz bowl. But anyway, so they're, they're different types and they are all amazing whether you go with a, a the original pure quartz or whether you go with one that's gold or platinum or uh, alchemical fusion whatever you know they all have their special qualities they're all very powerful just go with your intuition exactly exactly and they're all available through holographic sounds amazing yes and for those who are maybe not ready yet to buy those uh, beautiful balls, how can they use their voice to do same or approximately the same work? Because um, when I signed up for the sound healing course from your school, I asked, which one should I bring? And you said, oh, you don't need them. You just need your voice. I'm like, wow, <laughs> is that enough? And what was interesting that... Um, at the same month, I also had yoga school. I don't know what worked, but my voice really became so much more powerful. I think uh, even my mother noticed. She said, wow, it became louder, but louder in a good way. Not like crazy louder, but just more stable and more with roots and oh. bright. And uh, I think one of the things which really one of the seeds you planted in my mind by saying by that practice when we're supposed to go in a separate uh, rooms through the zoom 
and do sound healing right. on our partners. And it was interesting practice because I ended up with in a private room with a girl I've never met. I never saw her before. And I just had to do this healing work on her. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, <laughs> I supposed to, to sing right now? <laughs> and uh, then your words were so supportive. You said, just let this energy go through you. It's not you. Don't take any responsibility for this noise. If you worry about your noise, that's your ego coming up. Just don't think about that. Just be the channel. And I was like, whoa. <laughs> and, and I was like, is it me? <laughs> What's that? And she said, I have goosebumps. I feel felt here and there certain sensations and worms and love and bless. And I was so surprised. I was like, I can't believe I'm doing this. And then also I went to yoga school. It was a lot about uh, diaphragm breathing and I think all together but I really felt the shift in the last couple of months uh, in my practices and uh, I'm looking forward to for COVID to end up and I will use this singing balls in my yoga teacher trainings in my uh, classes with my students yeah excellent so <clears throat> beginning to to use the voice and i and i think you're right i think that both played a part in the strengthening of your of your sound mm -hmm. um because it's much of it is about the breathing yeah you know and the you know being aware of your diaphragm which is your your volume control you know the diaphragm is what controls the amount of air that comes through and once you're able to regulate that then you can really I mean, you can you know your sound changes mm -hmm. so I think I think both of them went into you know to um, helping to strengthen your voice yes so that's a good thing yes yeah, so don't be afraid and of losing it <laughs> No, don't, don't. And if you need to do it by yourself, fine. Do it by yourself. Um, get, you know, you, you had a, an original question with that. And it was how to, uh, how can someone begin to use their voice if they, you know, without having a crystal bowl, uh, if they can't afford one yet or whatever. Um, most of most of you can afford at least a download, a CD. Of course, not a lot of CDs out anymore, but um, a, a music download of a meditative type, whether it be mine or anybody else's, and use it as your background and begin to play with your voice along with the recording. And let your voice blend in and through the recording. And same thing, once you get a crystal bowl, harmonize with the bowl. You know, let the bowl and your voice become one together. And it will just give in to it. And let that energy of spirit move through you. And without judgment without judgment. I mean, that's so important. Realize that when you're coming from your heart, whatever sounds, whatever tones come through, they're perfect. They're perfect. The only time that there's an issue is when our, our judgment, our left brain gets too active and our judgment gets in there and, and we start criticizing ourselves for the sound that we're making. Even when you're, when you're working intuitively, sometimes sounds that come through may be n not pretty. But the thing is, it's, it's not always pretty sounds that do the healing. Mm -hmm. It's whatever vibration is created when you're working intuitively whether it's a pretty tone or whether it's not when you're coming from your heart 
and allowing that intuitive energy to move through, you can't go wrong. Absolutely. So whatever the sound is, just let it happen and be okay with it. I mean, when I do meditations, sometimes the sounds that come through, it, it's, it's like if I was consciously thinking about it, I wouldn't do it because they sound too weird sometimes. So just put the ego aside, you know, just talk to it, say thank you for sharing, and get on with your, your intuitive side and let that energy flow. So good. So inspiring. <laughs> thank you so much. And for our You're listeners, welcome. how can we find you on your website or in social media? And what materials and instruments are available there for us? Well, you can find me through holographicsound.com. That's H-O-L-O-G-R-A-P-H-I-C-S-O-U-N-D.com. That's the website. Uh, all of the, the crystal bowl information, uh, ordering, uh, whatever, is there. Um, all the trainings that are coming up, and I've actually got several that are coming up now. Um, you can find all of them on the website. As far as social media, uh, on Facebook, if you go to Holographic Sound and Inner Balance, you will come up to my uh, business page. You can also go to my personal page, and that's it's just simply Paul Hubbard. Yes. Um, Instagram is holographic underscore sound underscore healing, and uh, you can get to me there. You can also, if you've got questions, uh, you can email me. And you can email me at paul at holographicsound.com. I'm, I'm at all of them. They all come to the same place. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing you are, this you're, information. You're welcome. Yes. You're welcome. Thank you. And thank you so much for inviting me. Absolutely. On your show. Yes, thank you for being in our it's space. It's so warm. Thank it's been you. my pleasure. <laughs> and uh, we'll I, we'll have a uh, a little clip experience that that um, short meditation. Can, yes, I ask uh, yes. Doctor Paul uh, Hubbard to have this little meditation at the end as a bonus, so you can experience this feeling which these beautiful singing balls are creating and paul's voice it's magical i have goosebumps in different parts of my body and i absolutely love it you'll enjoy it thank you